I really didn't expect to have this idea, it just kind of came to me. I mean, I had always wanted to be a Girl Scout and sell their cookies when I was a child, but I never really got to, which definitely dampened my childhood. Um, but I say, when you have an opportunity, just go for it. What is it exactly that you do? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I buy large quantities of Girl Scout cookies from Girl Scouts, and then I sell them to the people here at my own price. I have a few people helping me with like logistics and stuff, but the whole thing is basically run by me. As you can see, we have my website here. It has the different kinds of cookies we have, as well as the amount we have at a time. It says here you have a max of 11 of one kind. Oh yeah, well, we're just getting started, so we don't have as many cookies as we might normally have if we were more advanced. But the website is really well run, thanks to my man Gary over there. Gary's my right-hand man. Anyways, we have our website just so that new or returning buyers can like give us a time and we can meet and they can pay us for the cookies. We're not sophisticated enough for delivery and stuff, so we mostly just meet the person where they want to meet and we do the trade-off of money and cookies. Cash only, of course. We're a local business. Does the school support you? Oh yeah, well, the school doesn't really support small businesses like ours. We've had a big, big cookie problem here at school, okay? It, it seems that a student is somehow operating some type of suspicious cookie operation. There's boxes everywhere, everywhere. Look, look, they're everywhere. I don't know what to do. So how has this business affected students here? Yeah, I mean, most of the kids like the cookies, so we'll do really anything to get them. It's not really bad for us, they just ask us to keep it on the down low. Yeah, that was kind of weird, but whatever it takes, you know. I just wish I thought of it first, you know. Her stuff sells out so quickly, and people will pay anything for it. This thing will be our little secret. Just for fun. Do I think they're on to me? Psst, no. I'm really discreet, and the students will do anything for the cookies. Yes, I have my suspicions. Yeah. It was Anna who asked me to come work for her after she saw me in coding class. I designed the whole website. Do I think she's a good boss? Yeah, I definitely think she's a good boss, but... I also think I should get more of the credit. I was born a Pisces, but deep down I think I'm an Aries because we're obviously yeah, Robin. Somebody told the teacher our secrets out. Wait, what? Who? I don't know. Listen, I don't know who your sources are, but they're wrong. Hmm. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because I know you and Gary are close. Huh? Gary? Gary. Yes, after some careful watching, I have a very strong feeling that Gary is our prime suspect. Oh, Gary! <clears throat> yeah, I just didn't know how to tell you because we've been friends for so long, you know? Like, what's a girl gonna do? Thank you, Anna. I, I know that took a lot. I appreciate it. Honesty, integrity, that's what we teach here at St. Albans. What did he say? Are we in trouble? Oh, no, no, no. But he does want to talk to you, though. Me? Yeah, but I'm sure it's just a formality or something. Look at these. Look at these. Oh, I can't tell you how many complaints I'm getting about this. You're charging people $15 for a box of cookies? It's ridiculous. Do I feel bad? Eh, a little bit. But you know what I always say. You got to make opportunities for yourself. Oh, look. Another order. <laughs> Gary Schlesinger, and I'm really pissed.
We sent out a survey to the upper school students at St. Stephen's about self-esteem. Here are the responses. The actors in this film are reading responses from students who submitted anonymously. What causes a negative impact on your self-esteem? School. I feel like there's a culture at St. Stephen's that revolves around competition and being the best. And when you're not the best, it kind of feels like you're worth nothing. And people always tend to overlook those who are in the middle. Friends in school. I'm not very good at school because I have ADHD and other things that make it difficult. So even when I put in effort, I don't see results. My friends are all very good at school and talk about their grades, which are obviously better than mine. They also talk about college. It has impacted me more than I've realized. Sometimes it hits how hard they're hurting me, obviously not on purpose. When I don't feel like the people in my life want to be in my life, almost all the time they do, but they don't remind me when I really need to hear it and it makes me feel unloved. How much does your appearance slash body image influence your self-esteem? Being called slurs based on my race, how I dress, and my sexual orientation. It hurts when people who don't even know me already hate me because I don't fit their definition of normalcy. I like my body because it's my body and it allows me to do things. And occasionally I feel happy about the way it looks, but that's more of a benefit than a requirement. But to answer the question, avoiding a detrimental relationship with my body has helped me boost my self-esteem. Body image is probably the biggest influence on my self-esteem. Especially in the athletic community, a lot of emphasis is placed on physical appearance and body image greatly affects how I see myself and my value. When do you struggle viewing yourself positively? When I'm hungry or when I go out in public. I become self-conscious about what I eat, how much I eat, what I wear, how I walk, and what people see when they're standing behind me. I begin to pick out negative things about myself in my head. I think it's when I have the most things going on, like homework, studying, and extracurriculars, because that's when it's really easy to let things fall through the cracks, which I usually beat myself up over. I think my struggle with self-image comes through with how successful or skilled I am. When I don't view myself positively, I view myself as a failure. Additionally, I sometimes struggle to connect and socialize with other people, and that can make me feel like an outsider, regardless of whether I'm being intentionally excluded or not. In any case, this can and has led to the line of thought that basically centers around what's wrong with me and why am I feeling so alone, and so on and so forth. And it's never just you, right? Like, tons of people talk about this experience all the time. And yet, I think people like to think they're a monolith quite often. Did this pandemic affect your self-esteem in any way? Can you describe how your self-esteem was affected and the reason why it was affected? I am now much more uncomfortable in tighter clothing, meaning tighter than sweatpants and a sweatshirt, because I experienced being in this clothing for a year straight. When I wear anything tighter or showing more skin, I cannot stop thinking about my appearance. I was and still am very self-conscious about any weight I gained over the pandemic. I think it affected me so much because there are so many beauty standards on social media saying that you can only be pretty if you're 120 pounds or lighter. Self-esteem got much worse because I tend to thrive when I have purpose and the pandemic completely made me lose my sense of feeling needed. It made me feel like I had no reason to be alive and it severely affected my mental health. Was there a time when you were quick to judge yourself negatively? I do it all the time. I have issues with fixating on the negative particularly in relation to myself and the things I do. While grieving the loss of a relative, I got behind on my schoolwork and I didn't finish a novel before we had to write a paper on it. I did poorly on the paper and my first thoughts was that I shouldn't have taken those days off and that I have a poor work ethic. I also thought that I was just not a good writer. Whenever anyone makes a rude comment, I immediately accept it as the truth and thus judge myself negatively. The general thematic occurrence is that my low self-esteem prevents me from standing up for myself. At pool parties, I hate how my body looks in a bikini. I always see these girls on TikTok and even my friends with these perfect hourglass bodies, but even though I'm skinny from the side, I look like a box from the front. What has the biggest impact on your self-esteem? Simple activities like being with friends, baking, or playing guitar, the simple life activities help my self-esteem because creating something, making someone smile, or being around people who think I'm worthy of being loved makes me feel like I'm creating or contributing to something positive in the world. 
I would say friends because I value their opinions. Sports also feed into this because when I'm doing bad, I can feel my self-esteem drop. But on the other hand, when my teammates compliment me, it helps my self-esteem. Definitely my friends. When I'm hanging out with my friends and sharing memories and thoughts together, it makes me feel more confident. I also feel like my appearance, particularly in clothing, has an effect on my self-esteem, unfortunately. And I feel best when wearing clothes that represent how I'm feeling inside. Something that caused me to have tough skin was multiple things going on on campus. I mean, every day you walk on campus and you're different. So when that happens, you, at first, maybe when I was in middle school, there was, I felt I was a shy person. I was not, like when I was little, I used to be very outgoing. And when I came here, I took a step back. Stereotypes at this school are, very powerful and it determines whether you're who your friends are and the people who talk to you it definitely determines how people see you and the way that people see you is so important because you can only do so much to change how people see you but once they've decided in their mind that they only see you as this particular thing then it's hard to change that. A lot of people, anytime I tell them I enjoy writing poems, 
they're always like, oh, really? You like writing poems? Whenever I talk about coding, I don't think, I think because I have such an outgoing personality and I laugh a lot, people are usually like, oh, you code? Because they always see people that code as like quiet and always in dark rooms and playing video games all day. So I guess that's like two things. I actually like to dance, I guess. Most people just see me as like this calm person, collected, always trying to be, you know, mature, I guess, and not, uh, you know, just don't, I just don't like to do too much, but I actually do, you know, like to go crazy once in a while. Just dancing around, just enjoying myself, you know, trying to just free myself from most of the, um, the reputation that most people have just given me, I guess. I think a lot of the kids at this school like to think that they, you know, like don't see color and whatever. But I think they're, it is, they definitely see black people through a specific lens. And um, black people have to try very hard if they're going to break that by maybe conforming to some stereotypes or it, that's what you often see is people either conforming or they just like don't conform and they kind of go on their own. That's what I would mean, just like not like hiding parts of yourself. Yeah, and maybe not talking so much about like social justice and that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely like, you know, holding yourself back so that people like don't make certain assumptions about you. I think there Stereotypes are pretty powerful at the school. I think there's a, a lot of scenarios when people will tell you that you act black or you don't act black, like you're not like the normal black person, whatever that means. Um, or maybe you act white, that's one of them. Um, or just the way you dress. If you dress differently, if you talk differently, if your hair is different, my hair is in braids now. I've gotten so many comments about how it changed all of a sudden. And I just wish that, I know that black people's culture is different than white people's culture, but every day we have black people at the school have to be involved with white people's culture. We basically have it engraved in our bones. Like, it's, we see it every day, but I feel like at this school, white people don't try to learn about not only black culture, Asian culture, Latino culture, like Indian culture, any, cult any other culture I feel like is downplayed here. When people see me on campus, I think they just see me as another international student that they will not interact with. I don't often consider myself pretty because I don't fit into a lot of, you know, like what society says is pretty, like society standards and stuff. Physically, I think I really like my smile, but I think it has been hard to really find something that I love about myself. Because, physically because I'm surrounded by the white beauty standard and I'm being compared to that. What does being black at St. Stephen's mean to you? Um, I guess being black is standing out because you rarely see black people around. So you being black, you just have to stand out. And um, no, it's kind of like being different from everybody, which sometimes can be annoying, but you know, it's like kind of like a superpower. I like to think that at the end of this journey, like out of all of it, I've come out a better person. I've come out stronger and I know who I am and I'm proud of who I am. And that's what I want people to know about me. I want people to know that I'm not insecure, I'm not ashamed. I am black and I'm beautiful and that's what it is. My name is Krishna Kadian and I'm 72 years old. I was born in India. 
I married my husband in India, Mohinder Kedian, and I have two boys, Vic Kedian and Vineet Kedian. When we came to America, I was 36 years old. It was very different for us, coming from India and then here, and we were nothing here. Nobody knows us. I hated America. I lived in many places, cities, and village, and my favorite was Lucknow. It was a city. I was a housewife. I had help, a lot of help in this house. That's why it's my favorite place. My favorite part was I I used to play cards. So, so I'll go to somebody's place with a group of the ladies will collect and will play. And do, during those play sessions, we will be served with uh, high tea, like tea and heavy snacks. And that was a fun part, and you dress up according to the season. I wore an Indian outfit mostly. This uh, is called salwar kameez and and sarees. Sarees were mostly I like to wear at the parties or formal get-togethers. What time of the day it is? What kind of function it is? Who is coming? All those matching jewelry, shoes, purse. Your makeup, your hairstyle, your manicure. There was not enough jewelry, enough clothes because there were so many functions. So my sister sponsored us. So it takes time. And then when our turn came, you go to embassy, and then they will interview you, and then they'll give you visa and, and permission to go. So in that time, my husband resigned from his job. He was. Colonel in the army, and then I had a full house of stuff. Then I distributed all to my family members. It was hard; like you, suddenly you have to leave everything behind. We couldn't bring much; only two suitcases were allowed. So some of our clothes, and I got my jewelry, and uh, and we were allowed only eighteen dollars to bring in. And that's it. So we decided so that first we'll go and settle down, and uh, find a job, and then our kids can join us. We already knew English, but uh, American English is different. Its uh, accent is different. Certain words are pronounced different, and uh, the customs are different. So it was very different for us. Coming from India and then here, we live in Edison, New Jersey. It was quite a come down. It was only one bedroom, living room, and a small kitchen, and we had just sofa come folding beds to sleep. No TV. It was pretty hard. So, the post office job I got in 1986. and before that i had to take exam so in those exams i could score 100% and i got lot of calls but i didn't want career job but i took clerk's job but most of it was strenuous standing job and picking up all parcels heavy parcel up to 70 pound and that was night time most of the time it was night time so i started around Five o'clock in the morning, and it was thirty miles from our house where we lived. I worked almost nineteen years, and I took premature retirement. I couldn't take it anymore. It was affecting my health. I started enjoying America after I left post office. Till then, not even a day I enjoyed America. I hated America. It took me twenty-six years to realize. Moving to America was good decision. It took me 26 years. I have five granddaughters, beautiful granddaughters, one grandson, Kate, Kadian, Maeve Kadian, Abby Kadian, Rose Kadian, Maya Kadian, and Noah Kadian. So what I want to teach them, and I've been teaching them. some indian tradition like indian outfits from their childhood like i'll get from india and make them wear take their pictures and the jewelry 
and my own jewelry i have given them so that they can wear as they go in teenagers and early tron and indian food and some indian tradition like there is a holi festival there is a diwali festival and uh, i wish they will continue when they get married so they have one indian function so they can keep the indian tradition and on top of that i am so glad that all of them like indian food they want to learn they want to cook and uh, i think they will keep some indian tradition they won't forget and they'll give it to next generation i am very proud and happy grandmother Welcome ladies and gentlemen, you're watching The Latest Night Show and I'm your host Hawkins Bohr. It's time to welcome our special guest of the night to the stage. Please welcome the conqueror of Gaul, the greatest dictator Rome ever had. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the stage, Julius Caesar. Thank you. Welcome Caesar, how are you doing? All right. So tell me Caesar, how was your life as a youngster? Well, I was. Privileged, descendant of Venus, born a patrician, never struggled for nothing, leading, a specializing, beaten, Pompey, Ptolemy, Galt, and others, ruling, I was all about the people, absolved their debt once I was regal, everything I did was made legal, wrapped in a toga when walking in Rome, made sure all the senate had to atone, but then betrayed, I was stabbed by Brutus, joined by the senate, all them were ruthless, 23 times the stabbing seemed ceaseless set off a clash so the next years were peaceless then augustus he had no weakness adopted by me i saw his uniqueness but this ain't about the boy i'm the one who's speaking caesar have you ever been captured just once caught lacking by pirates still was young and couldn't keep quiet so i bossed them around ruling like a tyrant got my ransom paid and didn't waste no time young julius gone just before night time but don't get it twisted the story ain't over came a week later and burned them to a smolder i see so you were rather violent well that's how it is living in Rome, that once great city was my home. I was one of the greats when leading an army, me and my men were all rather hardy. So, are there any more questions? Yes, is it true you invented the Caesar salad? No more questions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, looks like that's all we have from Julius Caesar. Next, we'll be talking to his lover to the south, Cleopatra. Hello? Who is this? Who are you trying to reach? What number is this? What number are you trying to reach? I don't know. I think you have the wrong number. Do I? It happens. Take it easy. Hello? Sorry, I guess I dialed the wrong number. So why did you dial it again? To apologize. You're forgiven. Bye now. I want to talk to you. They got about 225 numbers for that. See ya. Hello? Why don't you want to talk to me? Who is this? You tell me your name, I'll tell you mine. I don't think so. You got a boyfriend? Why? You want to ask me out? Do you have a boyfriend? No. You never told me your name. Why do you want to know my name? Because I want to know who I'm looking at. What did you say? I want to know who I'm talking to. No, that's not what you said. I gotta go now. Wait, I thought we were going to hang out. No, I don't think so. Don't hang up on me. I have to go. Don't. What? I told you not to hang up on me. What do you want? To talk. Dial someone else, okay? You getting scared? No, bored. 
Listen, asshole. No, you listen. I'll cut you and make it look like a bloody accident. What do you want? You think this is funny? You think you're alone? You're sick. Let's play a game. Please, no. What door am I behind? I don't know. It's okay. Don't worry. All you have to do is choose the right door. You have reached the voice mailbox of... Hi. Um, hey. Um, how are you? There's some things I've been wanting to say, but, um... I, I can't say everything now that we are no longer. But I hope you're happy and you're laughing. And like you used to when we were together, I hope. You're no longer stressed and anxious, and you're able just to be able to enjoy yourself. I know you had to finish our story before. Uh, before I wanted to finish our story, but I, I just, I just wanted to say how grateful I am for what we had. The laughs, the love, the tears. It was, it was really great. Just know, you have a special place in my heart. You made me a much better person. I became more positive. Um, I became more sympathetic. Most importantly, I was happy. Thank you for um, being you. I'll miss your rational thinking. I'll miss your sympathetic nature. I'll miss your protective nature. I'll miss your selflessness. I miss you but I don't wanna be so much. I'm sorry if, if I wasn't enough. If I did anything wrong. You, you said I never did. You never. You said I was perfect. That I didn't do anything wrong. But um, frankly, I call bullshit. Despite all my confusion, I remember that promise I made to you when we stayed up till dawn mid-January. I, I intend to hold that promise.
I feel like we're we're facing a, a, a battle against an invisible enemy who could be lurking anywhere, right? Distancing is is really the number one technique to prevent that spread from person to person. Hmm. Hmm. I can't believe these kids aren't social distancing. Every single day I try to tell them and they and they never listen. I believe we have these uh, animal instincts that go back a long way in our DNA, right? And so like like fish, like at some point we were all, not we, but you know, our, we descended, you know, the whole evolution, um, the water, water mammals, right? And so... Um, Hey! All right, guys, let's break it up. Spread apart. You know, social distancing. Remember, six feet. In general, I think everybody here at school is doing a pretty good job. I turn around for one second. All right, enough! I'm just trying to keep you guys healthy and safe. The constant reminding, I'm noticing that as I walk around campus uh, and people notice my presence, they uh, sort of automatically now uh, reactively sort of just uh, automatically, you know, give a step back, you know. In your opinion, what are some of the most effective ways of keeping students socially distanced? Well, that's a really tough, tough question. It's a tough job, right? Because uh, really it's a, a, you know, what I find most effective it is really just constant reminders. Um, How's it going? Oh, pretty good. Just finished practice, ready to play some COD. Yeah, we finally loaded into a game. Dude, for real, I'm about to wreck everybody in these lobbies. Yeah, these kids are terrible. This lobby is garbage. Did you see that kid, COD Killer 47, dude? He's so bad. Yeah, I think he just requested to join our party. Should I let him in? Yeah, dude, I'll just, I'll just bully him. How's it going? Do you guys want to play some Call of Duty? I was wondering if I can play with y'all. Hell no, kid. You're terrible. Dude, uninstall the game. You're trash. You can't even kill anyone. Do you have fingers? I'm sorry. My mom just got me this game for Christmas. Well, she should get your money back because it does not worth it if you're going to be this trash at the game, dude. I just wanted to make some friends and play with y'all, but I guess that isn't going to work out. Damn right it's not going to work out. You're terrible. Yeah, no wonder you don't have any friends. That's it. I've had enough. What are you, what are you going to do? Cry about it, dude? Jeez. Maybe Matthew Atchison. What? What? How do you How do you know my name? You just messed with the wrong kid. Shut up, loser! You won't do anything. Oh, really, Sam Levy? Get this kid out of here! What's he gonna do? Pull up? Please do it, dude. Yeah, that was kind of creepy. Dude, yeah. How does he know our names? What the heck? Someone just knock. Dude, who's there? I don't know. Should I open it? Yeah, go ahead. I don't see anybody. There's nobody there. Dude, what? Where are they? It must be a ding dong district. Did you see anything? I didn't see nothing.
There's nobody here. Dude, where'd they go? It's, that's so weird. Look at the package. What do you think's in it? Should I, should I open it? It's gotta be him. I'm gonna open it. Mr. Dolan here. Good to see you all. Thank you for coming. Beautiful night out here on the hill. The seniors have some things they want to say to the people coming up behind them making films. Woo! I want to say something to the seniors. So, seniors, Olivia, Olivia, Maya, Anouk, Gus, Peter, Sloan, Dylan. What a year. Thank you. Thank you um, for this year. It's been real. What? Huh? Jason. Nope. Don't. J. Jason? How do you spell that? It's not, I'm not getting it. Okay, we can check. I don't know, apparently some guy Jason was maybe, I don't know, I, think, I didn't see him. Uh, maybe you enroll, I don't know. Anyway, what I wanted to say was uh, in the midst of this difficult year, you know, you guys often um, in the class, it was very fun and very gratifying, and especially the way you treated one another. Um, you were kind and considerate and thoughtful, and you really listened to each other, and you helped each other make better films. And, uh, and also just talk about life, right? Um, so that was really important and made, made the year in some ways, you know, bearable, but like, you know, we got through it. We got through it. And I thank you. I really thank you. I miss you. I made a horrible mistake. I told them. I told them they were my favorite senior class. And after that, psh, disaster, colossal blunder on my part. Never do it again. Stay hard ass the whole year. Don't even try. So anyway, uh, so they have some words for you. And here they are. And I'll check the roster. Jason, don't think so. Uh, my piece of advice would be not to be afraid to make a new film be because you think someone's not going to like it. And in the end of the day, someone's not going to like your film, but someone will love your film. So I would say just go out, don't think, make your film, and share it to your favorite people. Okay. How do I start off? Like, hi, my name's Jason. Like, <laughs> no, how, how did you. S no, uh, just, just say it. Okay. <laughs> um, film is a very interesting subject and it's not something that you shouldn't take seriously and I think if you're truly like um, if you truly enjoy film then you shouldn't let like the short time period in class stop you from creating cool projects so spend out time outside of class watching movies and making movies um just have fun with it and do it with your friends. And it's really cool to see how something that you just thought of can come to life and you can show everybody. So I would say just start filming and then start editing and it'll all come together and have fun with it because it truly is supposed to be fun and it's not really an assignment. It's just when you see something that's worthy of being filmed, just film it. I forgot what it was. Son, you getting tired of holding that? Can you the I forget what it is. What was I gonna say? Oh, means make sure your prep before you shoot is good. Like film is not all about just getting a camera and going and shooting things. There's a lot of preparation that goes into it beforehand, and you have to make sure that you do that you're organized and you do a good job with that uh, if you want to make a really good film. All right, all right. I'm still going. Right. Oh, okay. So many other different mediums you. Like you can be impressionistic and you can be something other than reality, but 
when it comes to film, people want to, you know, just tell a story and they want to have like realistic dialogue and that kind of thing. And I think that's really intimidating for a lot of people. And so I would just say, like, really explore the options you have and explore your, explore your limitations because you can make more impressionistic and surreal stuff that doesn't have to be, like, under that limitation of reality. And it's, frankly, it's, like, easier to even find, like, locations or find, like, it's, it's if, when it's all in, in your mind and become, like, just from your mind on screen, like, I feel like that's, like, the purest kind of art there is even if there is kind of like a technological separation there you know a lot of the films here i know are made on a pretty low budget or no budget and they still turn out amazing so if you have like an idea for a bizarre project whether it be like live action whether it be animated there's all there's always going to be a way to make it happen never underestimate the amount of time a project will take because you'll find that, of course, everyone says, oh, you're your own worst critic and stuff like that, and people call themselves perfectionists. When it comes down to editing and sound design, not even including mistakes that could happen on and offset with file transfer and, and things not being plugged in and random out of focus shots, but the amount of tweaking that goes into it. I think a lot of people coming into film class have done some like film stuff on their phones, on iMovie, on things like that where the bar is a lot lower but when you're staring at a file in Premiere and you're judging your own work, um, it, you really find that there are a million and one things you can tweak and you never have enough time for them. So at the same time, my other piece of advice is don't try to make it perfect. Um, never let Mr. Dolan tell you that you have a bad idea because he... <laughs> Will I pretend that I quite like to stay away? Should I pretend that I don't mind, confined? I'm fine, I swear I'd say. Can I pretend I never noticed when I run? 
run out of ink, I guess that's it. What if I don't sit by and let myself decay? What if the ink I think reveals what seals the deed indeed someday? Armed with my proofs, my scripture, my spell, I'll take after Plato and Hobbes and Goodell. I'll give and I'll take, I'll make my own rules. The means of escape are at whim to my tools. senseless or defenseless oh too though time seems to pass i still don't age how long i've been here i can't quite gauge three that's all i can see more four i could have done this all before if i don't get there Should I pretend I never noticed The walls succumb to vanity Am I on my own? Can I still atone For things I've yet to do As of now, I can now begin The curse ಗಾಯ ನಪರ so she a lady engaged i have one brother one sister older both we were small four five years old because my sister was at their house then uh, he is uh, my sister husband brother they like him so they choose for me they choose like this is roka and this is we like others this are there so then we marry when i was 13 12 years 14 years old and my marry 
What were your first impressions? He's a good, but we didn't talk. I just to be shy. I saw him in the Mirapur, you know, Mirapur town. They have married some, so everybody went to there. We went. To, I saw him there. I I hide and look at him. <laughs> then we came to uh, India. We have our I don't know. See, we were in uh, Rajkot that time. When we came in uh, Chittor, then we came to Ajmer and we got married. Then Nana wanted to come. USA, that Rita born. When Papu was seven years old, and the Makati, get a friend, get a set, get it. Huh? Mommy, get diaper, you had a diaper. Nana dancing, she's looking. They have big hair, lot hair. Raja have lot hair. It's okay, Anna. Finish. बदल रही है रूप जिंदगी छाव है कभी कभी है धूप जिंदगी हर पल यहाँ जी भर जियो जो है समा कल हो न हो हर घड़ी बदल रही है रूप जिंदगी This meeting is being recorded. I think it's affected the way I view myself because some because I have it mirrored to where. Mm. Um, like this is the this looks normal to me so sometimes i'm like on zoom and i'm like i look real good like okay and then i'm like this is not how i look to other people though <laughs> like it's it's mirrored but like i don't honestly it measures it really is like if i look at myself one day and i'm like wow i look terrible <laughs> and then like other days i'm like i actually look pretty good so i'm like happy about that you're looking at yourself in the mirror so you have like this kind of tendency to like examine yourself and stuff because that's what we do we're very self-oriented I mean, you can't help but notice like, oh, my hair looks like that today. Or like, oh, I look like that today. You know what I mean? I'm kind of anxious seeing myself on video. Like in person, obviously there's no mirror. I mean, I I actually feel like I've caught in a bit less, um, kind of all like uptight about my like looks and stuff. Like sometimes I'll literally go to school in my pajamas. Like I know that sounds weird, but I'll just like wake up and I'm just too lazy to get on clothes. So I'll just stay in my pajamas. I, I feel like it's like the same as people looking at what people wear, but it's just like, because we can't really see people, what people wear now, we just focus on what like stuff that's around them. And I feel like you can tell so much about a person based on their background or like their camera placement. Like I was in my brother's room for a while mm -hmm. um, and there was like basketball jerseys like framed up behind me and I was like this is not how I want to see you. <laughs> but um, I think for, for other people um, just sort of like knowing how they live and like how they're like what color their room is or whatever it's it's fun. Because I see my room through my camera so I feel like, whoa, I have like nothing on my wall. And then like a lot of people have stuff on their wall. That's why like I got a bunch of wallpapers and stuff. <laughs> I feel like my wall is like falling apart all the time. So I feel like, you know. All these homeworks just laying around. It, it, it looks like a pigsty. I find myself looking in my background before I join a Zoom call to make sure there's nothing like, I, I don't even know like what it could possibly be in my background that I'd be like scared to show in my class, but I just do it anyway. The only time I ever notice it like kind of like being like strange is if you can see a person's like bed 
or if they're like on the bed. I do that. Uh, See, not but... not during the latter class of the day, but when I wake up, I don't want to get out of bed, so I just I usually go to my first couple classes and I I hope it doesn't bother people. It doesn't bother me seeing other people. I definitely do get distracted, sort of like making sure that I look like a human being and like presentable. I think it started off with me trying to fill up my time just because I was so bored. But then I started to learn how vulnerable I was to very little things that happened around me. I guess if that makes sense. Like very, I feel like I'm very fragile. You know, I feel like I got like anxiety issues and stuff like that. Like um, at the beginning of a quarantine. Now it kind of feels like the new normal. I think all my life I've kind of done so many different things and it almost feels like I'm always just being pulled in so many different directions and I'm kind of just like adrift. But for the first time, like, even though like I continue to like work and I continue to, you know, do things, but it's like I feel much more grounded than I have ever felt before. When I was a kid, I was like a really curious person. And like I sort of through middle school was like, oh, like that's lame. Like, I stopped like, doing that. And now like I feel like in quarantine, like I really got into like religion again and like some weird stuff that I've never heard of. And like I really into like politics and painting and stuff. And like I don't know, it was like a really great because I don't know, just to be become a curious person again and really value knowledge is like a whole nother level of like life's joys, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> that much time off gave me so much free time to do what I actually wanted. So I started like, I wrote, I wrote and I read books and I studied for the SAT, stuff like that I didn't have time to do in my normal kind of routine, pre-COVID or pre-quarantine. It feels more like me, like it's, it's easier to kind of tune out all of the excess stuff. Especially with like social media, I feel like you're constantly seeing people, like all sorts of different people, and you want to, I kind of want to be like the versions of everything. Quarantine has helped me think, like solidify what I want to be like. In many ways, I really haven't changed during quarantine, and that's something I like have to come to, um, I guess, like terms with, because I feel like I expected this huge transformation where like I'd be like a whole new person, like I blew up everything, and it just like, it definitely did not happen in like a dramatic way. It's just like, a, oh, like my perception of everything, I guess, changed. And like, I think of things a lot differently than I did, I guess, pre-quarantine. Honestly, I can't remember the last time when we were like, it was like normal. So it's, uh, I mean, it's like, I think everyone just kind of got used to Zoom classes. So, I, I mean, I don't have, I don't really have any problem with it but it just like sucks sitting in front of a computer for like the whole day.
Swag disclaimer. The following animatic you are about to witness with your own two retinal orbs is incomplete and a work in progress. Unfortunately, I did not have time to show the talent of all the epic voice actors who worked on this project because of certain schoolwork cough cough novel project cough cough astro and geo homework, but I will credit them at the end of the video. I plan to continue working on it during the summer, but I am very proud of what I have now and am excited to show it to you guys. Please enjoy. The almighty hyperbolic paraboloid is one of the most mysterious and worshipped math equations in the Milky Way galaxy it is defined by the equation x squared minus y squared equals z but the variables can be interchanged to make more dank and pogue champ equations one of the reasons this equation is so god tier is because some scientists believe that the shape of the universe is curved slightly in the shape of the hyperbolic paraboloid because of the lack of gravitational attraction matter has on the universe which would make sense cause how will the universe not be the most based? It's happening! <gasps> ah, jeez, you, you know I hate loud noises. Firenze, what is it? I'm going on a... a... Pilgrimage? A shopping spree? No, a candy shopping spree. That's the best kind. A date. I'm, I'm going on a date.
five minutes out. Prepare for deployment. Wait, do we have an hour left of flight time? Apparently not. You know what you're doing, right? Yeah, we've been over this. Don't tell me again. Once we land, we'll find cover. Stay low. You will get to me. You're damn right I will. You guys see the map? Huh? The map for our landing. You don't need to see this. You've already been briefed. Focus on the mission. Why the hell are you looking at it then? Check your strap. It looks loose. The strap's fine. I'm just trying to keep you alive. You don't have to get so angry about it. When I die, it'll be on my terms. Yeah, no one dies on their own terms. Well, I intend to try. Yeah, that's all you can do, isn't it? You're depressing. Pragmatic. Imagine a soldier bleeding out, surrounded by enemies. You think he's thinking about going home? His will? About peacefully slipping off this goddamn world? No, he's thinking about blowing the head off the next idiot that pops his head up from cover. He doesn't have control, but he keeps pulling the trigger. Why does he do that? He doesn't want to die. He's gonna die anyway. Nah, it's because every last breath is precious. And if he's gotta kill another goddamn soul, then so be it. He's got nothing to lose. Why are you telling me this now? Because you need to know. Black masses 
evil minds that plot destruction Sorcerer of death's construction In the fields of bodies burning As the war machine keeps turning Death and hatred to mankind Poisoning their brainwashed minds Oh, Lord, yeah. Life's the same, I'm moving in stereo Life's the same, except for my shoes Life's the same, you're shaking like tremolo Life's the same it's all inside Alright guys, uh, I guess thank you for coming in. This is obviously not something I'm excited about. You guys have caused me an unbelievable mountain of headaches. Alright? So let's talk about this. Um, I don't know where you're getting these film ideas and I don't know... What are you doing? I'm going to be asking the questions here. One, why is it so dark in here? Two, can I bring my own refreshment center? Should I have bought um, outside? Hey, Gus, we're not gonna do the whole bad cops. Good, good, two good, good cop, cops. Good, yeah. good, good cop, cop. Good cop. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Is it okay if I continue? The films that you guys are making and posting and projecting around the campus are filled with racial stereotypes, sexist innuendo and, and imagery. It's a disaster. Stop. I will send you the emails that I'm receiving from these so-called movies. Endless, non-stop objections, infuriations from the administration. Fascist. What do you say? The administration. Fascist. They've asked me to give them a recommendation as to whether or not you should be allowed to remain as students here. And I'm on the fence. Word. Mr. Dalton, name one example of any of our films that hasn't been just cinematic, pure gold masterpieces in, of, of cinema. Borax? Bor Borax was good. I love Borax. You love Borax. Everyone loves Borax. High five! Very nice! Very nice! And Borax! I love America! Very nice! I love America! I love USA! I love USA! I'm from Kazakhstan! High five! <laughs> I love American soil. It's very fertile. The lovable immigrant that is completely trafficking in racial stereotypes of Eastern Europeans and not funny. Another example. You guys made a kung fu film. Two, two I, like ridiculous performers in masks. And then you dubbed it into Korean.
얘네 둘말 진짜 듣지 마세요 갑자기 나를 불러세우더니 나보고 목소리를 녹화하라네요 갑자기 나를 불러세우더니 That it was Korean and not Chinese if you didn't know that we got Peter to do the dub? Konnichiwa. That's Japanese. He's good. He's really good. You know that half of our population is female. You haven't had one female character in any of your films. We had the one in that PSA that we made. We had that one. We can't work with women on set because we're too irresistible. Imagine this person is drug abuse. Get on the ground! I'm a female character! Eight Mile music video? His palm's sweaty, knees weak, he's so sweaty. God, he's so sweaty. Uh, Jason, I had to take it away. R E S P C. Tarantino? Bongiorno. Terminator? You have been exterminated. So before I give my recommendation to the administration, I need you to make a formal apology to this campus. Will you or will you not make this apology? Yeah, like... 30... 40? Solid, maybe. Yeah, Jason? Okay, guys, yeah, so what I did, um, I hooked up my computer to the teleprompter, to the TV, and when I type, it's gonna come up live. So I'll just type the speech to you. Gotcha. Okay, good idea. I'll just read it all out. Yeah. Okay, thanks, man. Yeah, thanks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, citizens of Earth, pause for applause. Um, we, uh, I'm here to apologize on behalf of Jason and Gus. I meant me. I don't know why I said Gus because I am Gus. Um, we're sorry for anything that we may have done to harm you or insult you. I meant to say insult you, not the other thing. Gus, don't read out all my typos. We're sorry to Sasha Baron Cohen for making a movie funnier than yours. That was not very nice. I'm really sorry for everything that I may have done. I personally made all of the mistakes. That's me speaking, Gus Cosby, you can, that's, this is legal proof. Um, we'll start uh, getting more diverse casts, like uh, women, instead of Peter dressed like a woman. What should I type next? Wait, uh-oh, did I turn text-to-speech on? How do I turn text-to-speech off? Gus, don't read this. Hey Siri, okay Google, okay Siri, hey Google, hey okay, Google. Okay, okay Google, okay Google. Hey Siri, hey, hey Siri, Amazon, Amazon Alexa. Alexa. Thank you. And good night.